an honor to be here. Uh, it was 22 years ago that Maxis was founded, and uh, the initial uh, thought of Maxis was games for Jeff. I really was creating games for myself. I wasn't thinking about anybody else. And uh, at the time, I had a $4,000 computer, and I love games, and so I was playing all the games were available, but they were all for teenage boys and my reflexes, I couldn't get past the first level. And I'm like, how is it that games are being produced on the PC for people that can't afford them? <laughs> and what about games for people that can? And I bet there's a market for games for people like me, which was really the beginning of Maxis. Uh, and so uh, the name Maxis, just so you know, came, uh, I, I held a contest and it was the fewer syllables the better. I wanted X, Y, or Z and I didn't want it to mean anything and my father won it and he said, well look, it's Ma and Sis, that's family. There's an X in the middle, that's what you wanted and backwards at 6 a.m., isn't that cool? And, and I couldn't argue with that and that's Maxis. So, um, <laughs> And uh, so let's see here. Uh, there we go. It started with pizza and beer. So um, I decided I wanted to get in the game industry, but I didn't know what to do. And I had a few friends who were in the game industry. And I said, how do you meet people in the game industry that are developers? How do, how do you get going? And they said, oh, it's really simple. Pizza and beer. And, and, and what do you mean? Oh, but everyone loves pizza and beer, so just have a party. So I literally took their advice and I had a series of parties over a few months where um, we would set up a bunch of video games and uh, say anyone who's in the game industry is welcome. And uh, one of the people who showed up was Will Wright. And, uh, and uh, so I, he was a very shy kind of a character. This is Will here at our pizza, little pizza gathering. And uh, I, uh, came up to him and said, well, what do you do? I make games. And uh, he said, you won't like the games I make. Um, and uh, I said, well, why not? And he goes, they're really bad. And uh, <laughs> no one else likes them either. And uh, so I said, well, what is your game? And he goes, well, I've got one I'm working on. I call it the City Simulator. And he says, no one wants it. It's really bad. Um, and so I said, well, I'd really like to see it. Um, and so, can I come over to your house and check it out? And he goes, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> I went over his house, and what he showed me was uh, SimCity on the Commodore 64. And uh, I couldn't believe it. He literally, on 64 bytes, had San Francisco, a monster attacking, the Fisherman's Wharf, the Bay Bridge, traffic, buses. I couldn't believe, how is this happening on a Commodore 64? And so uh, to give you an idea, this is what I saw. Um, the first version of SimCity. Uh, and uh, I was floored, I couldn't believe this. Uh, this is unbelievable. Um, and uh, the game was actually finished. And he'd had it, he'd finished it a few years earlier and no one wanted it. He took it to a bunch of publishers and the consensus was these publishers publish games and so they'd ask him, how do you win? And uh, he said, you can't win, um, it's just a city. And they said, well, if you can't win, it's not a game we don't want. Um, so I asked him, uh, you know, let's start a company. Absolutely. So he was all behind it. Um, the basis of SimCity, a lot of, most people don't know, is actually from a game that came out in 1984 that Will programmed called Ray on Bungling Bay. And uh, Will calls this uh, the stupidest game ever. And uh, it, it, unfortunately, or it didn't do well in the US, but in Japan it sold over a million units on the NES. <laughs> and Will couldn't believe it. He said, I'd do this for free, and here I'm getting all this money from this silly, stupid game. But the way it was is you had to fly a helicopter and you had to blow up the city before the city built the infrastructure to blow you up. And, but in that process, you had to build a, uh, the buildings and the, the simulator for it. And when he was finished, he kept on building the simulator because it was actually more fun than the actual game. And he said, you know, my next game is going to be building cities. So, um, whoops. 
So we created SimCity and literally it was developed in my house. This is one of the bedrooms. And uh, we had a team of people uh, uh, creating the SimCity for all the various versions, the uh, Mac and the Amiga. And uh, it was really without us knowing it at the time, it was the beginning of a new world of open-ended simulation games. Um, it just so happens Will's next door neighbor was the city planner for Oakland, California. And he gave Will all these city planning books. And it became the basis of uh, SimCity with the uh, Nim NIMBY, Not In My Backyard, uh, 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 the, the whole thing of uh, zoning and all the pieces of it came together through this gentleman named Bruce Jaffe who gave Will all the... Uh, uh, so this is my living room. We literally had uh, five programming workstations in my living room. This is one of them. And uh, I was just going to say, you know your team is dedicated when you find sleeping bags under the desk and uh, you come in the morning and they're still there. Um, so. Um, here's the kitchen. Uh, this gentleman's name is Mike Bremer. I've known him since the third grade. Uh, he came in and did all the documentation, and he's sort of the voice of Maxis and SimCity as far as all the text. And he actually invented the word Sim and the SimCity. This man gets the credit. Uh, he actually wrote a short story about simulated people called The Sims before we ever even approached him or, or, or anything. And so when I came to him, we said, well, we have this game called City Simulator. And I showed it to him, and he goes, oh, it's Sim City. And, and I'm like, what? And he goes, well, it's a bunch of Sims. And, and then he explained to me his story, and so he gets credit for uh, the, the Sims. So we actually uh, shipped the game in 1989, 20 years ago. Um, and fortunately moved out of my home. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, let's see here. Uh, we became a full game publisher, and not because we wanted to, because no one else would. And so literally the reason Maxis became one of the most successful game publishers was because no one else would touch it. Mm -hmm. um, we would have gladly let someone else publish it. Um, so at first, uh, the sales were really quite slow for the first few months. It was just such a strange thing. No one knew what to make of it. Um, and it, it, had, it was such a different kind of a game. Um, just to give you an idea, we had all these cities with special scenarios. So San Francisco had an earthquake. Boston had a nuclear meltdown. Hamburg was firebombing. Detroit was obviously crime. And Tokyo was the monster. <laughs> And what's interesting here, you see the packaging, and there's the monster. And most people don't know it, but Godzilla literally attacked Maxis the next month. Um, we got sued by Toho, who owns Godzilla. And even though we didn't use the name Godzilla and we called it a monster, they said it was a likeness and um, it was a long drawn out lawsuit, um, which was settled eventually. So then a few months later, the first review in Newsweek magazine ever, uh, was released. This is the first review of a video game ever in Time or Newsweek, a major publication. And it just so happens this writer uh, was going on a vacation, had just bought a Mac, went to the store and said, well, what's interesting, what's new? And they said, oh, you got to check out SimCity. He took it with them on a vacation. He came back from his vacation, calls us up. I've been playing this thing for two weeks straight. What the hell is going on? You know, who are you guys? What, what is this? And so he says, I'm sending a news crew, and we're going to do a full page story for you. And uh, they show up literally um, at my house, and they're like, we're at the wrong place. No, this is it. I'm um, sorry. Um, and uh, so they couldn't take a picture of anything, so they took screenshots. And um, literally within a, a week of this shipping, uh, the dam broke, and sales completely went through the roof and a game that couldn't get published two years earlier that no one would take became uh, the game of the year. Um, in 1989, basically there wasn't an award we didn't get. It, it was just, it was insane. Um, and we just heard from everybody that, that was playing it. They, they couldn't stop playing it. And um, what's interesting is I, I sort of have a theory is there's a lots of interesting stuff out there as you're gonna see over the, face of this conference, but 
certain things come up above the, uh, the, I call it the whale's tail. There's a lot of things in the ocean, but every now and then you see a little whale tail, which represents a small fraction of what's actually in the ocean, but you can see it. And SimCity finally got above the noise level, and uh, uh, we became famous uh, almost overnight for producing weird, offbeat, unusual games that no one's ever done before. Um, just an example of how far it's gone. Um, this is an example of an engineering contest that's been going on for 18 years um, that uses SimCity for seventh and eighth graders to create their vision of the city of tomorrow. Um, and if you want, you can check it out, but it's been going on for 18 years. And, and every time I see this, it just blows me away that here we are, you know, 18 years later, and it's considered a, 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 a something so strong. Um, I'm just, it just amazes me the impact that SimCity has had so far down the road. Um, another example of that, is the uh, OLPC on um, one laptop per child. SimCity uh, in uh, January 2008, the source code for the original SimCity was released uh, as free uh, open source software. And now every OLPC ships with a copy of SimCity. Um, so uh, we're famous for what me and Will used to call software toys. This is sort of an open-ended version of a game where you get to create and uh, um, set up your own goals, decide where you want this game to go. Um, so uh, he'll, here's Will in 1990, a year later. Uh, we were all after him for SimCity 2, obviously. And uh, he said, no, nah, I have a bigger idea. And uh, he came to me and I said, well, what's your bigger idea? And he goes, we're going to do the whole planet. <laughs> and I nearly died, you know, like, uh, it wasn't enough to do a city. Um, and so uh, uh, I thought it was the most audacious idea I've ever heard and completely non-commercial. Um, <laughs> so we went ahead with it. And uh, we created SimCity, the simu Sim Earth, the simulation of the planet. Uh, What's amazing about this is uh, almost 20 years later uh, that, you know, with the focus that global warming has, back then it had zero uh, uh, visibility and no one talked about it. And we worked with this gentleman named James Lovelock, who was a famous earth scientist. And we literally sent James Lovelock a copy of the game in development every few weeks throughout the entire development to say, is this accurate? Is this real? Um, an interesting point was that James Lovelock was absolutely adamant that we have to get our act together as a planet because his theory is he called it Gaia, it's the Earth is a living life form. And he said, if we don't get our act together, the Earth's going to die. And he was serious. Um, the, the funny uh, part of this, or not funny, really, I, I, we talked to him just a few years ago and we said, okay, James, how's it going? And he's like, what should we do now? And he's like, oh, it's too late, it's all over. Um, there's no hope for the planet at this point, um, which is a little sad. There, there actually is a, a, an end to Sim Earth, the game, and uh, this one actually had an end, and it's when the sun becomes a red giant and destroys the planet. Um, so to give you an idea of the kind of complexity that we had in Sim Earth, um, we had uh, the Earth is a living form, life form organism. We had evolution. The time spans was billions of years. Terraforming, uh, continental drift, major Earth disasters. We were uh, evolution of plants, animal, bacteria. It's 1990 on a PC. I mean, it's, it's, it was out of control. Um, and give you an idea of what the game looked like, uh, because you probably haven't seen it, but these are some sample screenshots. <laughs> And what happened is, is that Will got so deep into the science of this thing that it actually wasn't a lot of fun. And uh, although it sold well uh, and people played it, no one really quite got what, the, what was going on here. And what happened is the model was so complex and deep that literally the game would just take off no matter what you were doing and you're trying to stop things and you're trying to stop global warming and you're trying to stop disasters, but it didn't care, it just kept going. <laughs> and, and so it was sort of the first game that Maxis did that just took on a life of its own and didn't care what you did, it just went. And, and we're gonna address this again and again in the history of Maxis, but we kind of found that 
There is a limit to what you can present to people and still make it fun. Um, the next game we did is Sin Ant. Uh, still, I was begging for SimCity 2, but didn't get it. Um, Will, I said, why do you want to do ants? And he goes, well, I was watching these ants in my backyard, and they're really cool. And I'm like, okay, here we go. You know, we just got off Sim Earth. Um, so we're going to go with ants because it's really cool. Um, he read a book by a gentleman named Edward O. Wilson, who, uh, a famous evolutionary biologist called The Ant, which is this huge tome about ants. And uh, basically, he came up with this term called emergent com emerging complexity. And the idea is you can have very simple uh, creatures doing very simple tasks, but when you put millions of them together, it becomes a very complex structure and behavior. And so Will wanted to see how far we could go with this, um, with the product Simant. So this game was actually simpler. Uh, you could actually have a win and a lose. The, the, the win is if you kill the queen, and the lose is the ants make it into your house and raid your kitchen. <laughs> um, so it was real clear. It was the closest thing we probably ever came to uh, a game. Uh, but that didn't stop Will. I was still begging for uh, SimCity 2, but I didn't get it. What I got instead uh, was uh, uh, evolution on your home PC in your spare time. And so Will, Will was adamant that uh, we were going to simulate an ecosystem and you're going to create your own characters. And just, I mean, it, the audaciousness of this just gets wilder and wilder. And so in this one, you modify the genetics of the plants and the animals that inhabit the virtual world. Um, just to give you an idea of what this game looked like, uh, it's very similar to Sim Earth, and it, it, once again, it got out of control. Um, and once again, the game would just run off on its own, um, and things would happen that you couldn't change. Uh, and uh, so, um, I don't know if anyone here knows, but if you combine Sim Earth, Sim Ant, Sim Life, and a whole lot more ambition, what do you get? Anybody? That's right, it's four. You know, so, so it's really funny that, 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 that uh, Will, you know, has put so much, you know, people don't realize that Score actually had probably, you know, 15 years worth of work before, uh, of, of the, what went into this. And the, the, the truth is, once again, it's a game that kind of ran away. Um, people really enjoy making characters and creatures, but to try and control it is very difficult. And uh, it really didn't um, have the success versus the um, high profile that it actually had. Um, Spore happened after I left Maxis. Um, I, I'm not sure I would have advised it, but uh, it, it's just Will uh, and his unbridled ambition to take this thing further than anyone could ever imagine. And he definitely did that. Um, so now I'm going to go into the history of The Sims. Um, the Sims, personally, I always thought would be the uh, the, the epitome of the, the, the most ambitious and, and, and the most successful, and it turned out to be that was the case. Um, the the, the um, Sims had a very simple beginning. Um, it actually, the idea of the Sims came from a few places, but one of them is Sim Ann, and this is actually the first Sim home. Um, and this got Will thinking about, well, what if we did a simulation with people in it? What if we just took the home and wouldn't that be interesting? And uh, we had another idea that came to us was from a guy named Howard Gardner who had a column at the end of Scientific American Magazine with interesting ideas and he came up with this idea called Party Planner. And the idea was how to create the perfect party using a simulation. Um, and what happened is, is you would assign each of the people, how much they like or dislike each other on a scale of one to 10, and then you put them in the party, but eventually they'd stop because they'd be in the most comfortable place. So what you did is you put in food and drink, and then they'd have to go there and go near people they didn't like, and that kept the thing going. And we were just intrigued with that. Um, another major influence was a book called A Pattern Language, which we read uh, uh, when, after we had done SimCity uh, by Christopher Alexander, and basically, it's architectural theory about uh, uh, 
f function rather than form. So for example, he argues for uh, not using thin posts to support roofs because it'll scare people they think they're gonna get crushed. Um, he argues that balconies should be more than six feet deep because if it's thinner, people aren't comfortable and they won't use it. Uh, and so um, at the time when we were starting The Sims, Will thought that home design software was actually selling really well in the early 90s. And we couldn't figure out why because we knew that not that many people were actually remodeling their homes. So we figured people wanted to be architects. And uh, the uh, initial thought with uh, The Sims was Sim Architect. Um, the next major influence on The Sims was the Oakland firestorm in 1991. Um, 3,800 homes were burnt down, of which one was Will Wright's. And literally, we the office turned into a triage center for home burnt, burnt, burnt home, home burnt victims. And literally, we had home people living in the office for a, a month or two there uh, that had lost their homes. And in the process of Will buying a new home and remodeling and refurnishing it, he realized that this is actually pretty interesting. And he realized that that's what the sim should be, is you start with a refrigerator and then a stove, and uh, you start adding things in. And he sort of came up with this idea that it's sort of a, about acquiring objects. Um, I don't know if you ever saw the, the movie Fight Club, but at the beginning it has this Ikea moment where you're buying all these things. And it had this sort of influence on Will. Um, so here is the first sample box shot of uh, The Sims. It was at the time called the Experimental Domestic Simulator, also known as Dollhouse. Um, what was funny was we had a lot of uh, marketing people at the time, and so they insisted on doing uh, market research on this idea. And whenever they said the game is called Dollhouse, Immediately, everyone was like, we don't want it. And uh, so all the marketing people immediately uh, decided that uh, this should end. This is really uh, not going to work. And no one's going to buy a dollhouse. Um, it also became known in Maxis as the toilet game. Um, when we first did the first version of The Sims, the first object was actually a toilet. That's all we had, a toilet and a bunch of characters. and. Um, it really wasn't a good choice of the first object because the management of the company thought we were out of our minds. Um, <laughs> the, and, but Will really liked the toilet because he felt it was really interesting because uh, there were so many different kind of interactions you could do with it, you could clean it. <laughs> uh, it turned out he thought this is like the most interactive object in the house. And he, so he decided that's what he was gonna build it all around. And the truth is, the Sims is really, uh, uh, the toilet plays a prominent part to this day. Um, so, uh, um, the, just, just to mention, um, there was a huge struggle within Maxis around the Sims, such so that none of the man, we couldn't get the marketing people or the product development people behind it. They all thought we were completely out of our minds. So Will and I, what we had to do is do this undercover and literally set up almost a stealth budget and not tell anyone what we're doing. We set up an office literally in San Mateo, 30 miles away from the office, and didn't tell anyone that we had opened this other office. And that employees would go there and nobody knew because we didn't want them to know that we were actually uh, working with these people in San Mateo, um, building the dollhouse, the toilet game. We didn't want them to know. Um, and uh, uh, it, it was really one of the most rude pieces of the company for me and Will not being able to convince the board or our own management team that this was a good idea. Uh, but the design issues were, uh, first of all, the object-oriented uh, interface. It's the only game I know to this day that uses a, we had to design our own object-oriented operating system to operate the game. Uh, basically, you can build, buy, and deliver the remote selections. Initially, we built the characters very, very smart, and we realized it really wasn't much fun. Um, so we dumbed down the characters and made them uh, 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 almost uh, stupid, um, but we made the objects really, really smart. And uh, that worked well. Um, and so that's why we didn't have, um, when they talk, it's called Simlish, and they kind of mumble. 
is that we actually didn't want them to seem smart. We wanted them to seem really stupid. Um, just to give you an example, um, all the objects are really smart and they talk to the characters. The characters are actually almost empty. There's really not much going on. So when you come to the fridge, the fridge will yell at the character and say, are you hungry? I can satisfy your hunger. Five points, come to me. Okay, so when you go to the stairs, the stairs say, put your fir first leg here, put your second leg here, put your third leg here. The character, when he goes to a chair, doesn't know how to sit down. The, ch the chair passes the motion code to the character that says, here's how you sit. Um, here's another example of a bathtub yelling, hygiene seven over here, you can get clean. Um, but the, the truth is the characters are like empty shells and all the objects are really, really smart. Um, it's something that uh, I was really proud of, this object-oriented operating system. It's, it's, it's actually really sophisticated. And because of that, unbeknownst to us, we were able to do these expansion packs. Um, at the time, we didn't think about it, but the, uh, the object-oriented operating system makes it really, really simple to start throwing objects into these expansion packs that do a lot, and it just plugs right in and works. Um, so why were the Sims successful in my mind? People are interested in people, fundamentally. And I always knew that that would be uh, a big piece of for the Sims, is that people, they immediately would program in their family or their friends. Um, it appealed to girls. It's the first game that we know of that appealed to majority girls. Um, the girls drove this market wild. Over 70% of uh, Sims players were girls. Um, teenage girls specifically, uh, the core market here. And never has there been such a game. Um, one of the more interesting things about The Sims is people create stories that aren't in the game. They start telling you about what their Sims are doing, and we didn't program it, it's not in there, it has nothing to do, but they're talking about, well, these, these characters, they're artists, and they, uh, they really don't have day jobs, and they, they just go on and start telling these stories, and we never put it in there at all. We didn't have anything to do with it. Um, and Will likes to talk about that a really good game designer has two designs. One is the design that goes in the computer, but one is the design that happens in the people's minds. And what you're trying to do is influence what happens in their minds. Um, and, and Sims really, I thought, was uh, almost a Rorschach test of the people uh, uh, and their view of the world. So you can create your own characters, create your own home. A lot of people got into the home decoration part of it. Um, and people like to make characters with familiar objects. Uh, they enjoyed using their imagination. Um, and as I said, the game takes place in the mind, not on the computer. Um, so to end it, uh, what makes a Maxis game or what made Maxis games? And uh, really it was open-ended. They were no win or lose. They all had a pride of user creation. People would always say, that's mine. That's my earth. That's my city. That's my Sims. Um, the imagination, everyone always said, look at what I'm doing. And they were shareable, I could give you my city, I could give you my sins. Uh, they all had the ability to be expanded on, um, open-ended sandbox design. Um, the games typically had surprising results that go somewhere that you might not expect. There was always humor. Um, unusual themes, I think that got us a lot of press. Um, and it got, uh, people were just like, what? Uh, what's this? Um, unlimited permutations, you'll never play it twice the same. And play it twice the same. And uh, uh, editing tools uh, that are very much like a paint program, but it's a game. Um, so this is my last slide. Uh, what were my big lessons? You know, truthfully, it's to believe in yourself and never take it won't succeed for an answer. We were told at every step of the way, um, from SimCity all the way through the end, um, that our games wouldn't work, that it would never, uh, no one will like it. Uh, no one wanted SimCity, no one believed in The Sims. Uh, people laughed at us all along the way. Um, but we continued to stick with it and uh, never under underestimate the value of persistence, uh, just sticking with things forever. It just got better and better and better. 
And here we are with the latest version of The Sims, and, and it's just unbelievable the reality they're taking this to, and you know what, where the game has gone. Who would have believed that at the beginning? Um, so that's that's my talk. Uh, I'm just wondering if, uh, remember these? Yeah, here we are, the Marty the Mouse and uh, Trouble Cheese Sims, SimCity. Absolutely. Floppy disks. <laughs> the future is here. Yeah. What was the story of Marty Mouse? That was interesting. You know, we, we hired, we always tried to find talent. And uh, it turned out uh, Gene and Lauren, uh, they were the actual creative talent behind Carmen San Diego. Uh, it was Lauren Elliott and Gene, and I'm losing my mind. Uh, fortunately, yeah. So uh, these guys were super talent, and Bruderbun got really corporate at one point, and Gene and Lauren just weren't happy anymore. And so I went to them and just said, what do you guys want to do? And they wanted to do Marty Mouse. Uh, <laughs> I didn't really care. Honestly, I'm a firm believer in talent. I really don't care about ideas all that much. I really care about talent. And uh, Gene and Lauren are super talent. And so a lot of times, I'd be impressed with someone, and what do you want to do? And just do it. I, I, I really didn't. So this was kind of a silly game, actually, in hindsight. But Gene and Lauren were super talented. One of the things I remember is you could blow into a, you see a, a, a mouse would jump into a leaf, and then you blow, and each puff would make the mouse go across, remember that? Yeah, you know, these guys were super, super, super creative. Um, they were the, the talented team behind Carmen San Diego. Um, so I just said, do whatever you want. What are they doing now? Unfortunately, Gene is no longer with us. He died a few years ago. Um, and Lauren is doing children's software, but I'm not, ex oh wait. It's some kind of website or something. I really don't know. Uh, I don't know. Um, well, thanks for a, a great talk. Uh, can you take a yeah, couple absolutely. questions? Yeah, absolutely. If anyone has any questions or anything. Yes, yes. The Sims? So about the, what do you want to know? Well, okay. There's a lot I didn't say in here. Obviously, I just wanted to do a quick 20-minute talk, and I, and these are mostly product people, so I didn't really want to get into the business side of it. But in 1995, Maxis went public. Um, we I went public on the a Nasdaq. And we were under enormous pressure for quarterly profits. Uh, it's probably the biggest mistake I ever made. Um, and so we really couldn't put the kind of time and energy into the Sims it deserved. And the management team really didn't believe in it. Uh, the company nearly failed, uh, and we sold it to Electronic Arts um, in 1997, two years later, a year later, a year and a half later. So uh, when Electronic Arts bought the company, um, they wanted, they, they thought the major asset was SimCity, and I kept on telling them, no, that's not the major asset, the major asset's the Sims. And literally EA put together the resources and the money and the time and pulled everybody together and built the team up to something like 80 people uh, between 1997 and 2000 when the first version shipped. Um, the marketing estimates from Electronic <coughs> Arts when it shipped in 2000 was 600,000 units. It did 6 million units the first year. They, they didn't know. Um, and, but then EA really put the effort behind it uh, to where it is today. But it didn't happen. <coughs>